In old Constantine, there lived a cousin of the Baal Shem Tov, whose name was Reb Shmerl. And Reb Shmerl was a sinner. He committed one sin after another. What does it matter if I sin twice or sin twenty times, he said. At the end of the year, I take all my sins and I drag them down to the edge of the water. And I throw them into the lake, and that is the end of them. And for the new year, I am a clean man. So Reb Shmerl lived from year to year, and each year the sea became a little blacker because of the sins he threw into it, and each year the bundle of sins that he brought down to the edge of the water was greater than that of the year before. The lake is close to my house, he laughed. I have not far to carry my sins. Let there be a few more in the bundle. But his wife said, it is because of your sinning that God does not send us a son. His wife was a righteous woman, a tzaddikin. Reb Shmerl said, Do you really think that's so? And she said, Yes. Then he said, Well, perhaps it is really so. And he thought no more about it. And that same year, he committed a sin that was uglier than all the sins he had ever made. This sin was huge and shapeless. It was like a great sponge, oozing and dripping with mud. He could hardly find a place to hide it until the end of the year, when he would throw it into the lake. He put it into the basement of his house, but there the sin seemed to grow larger, to expand until the basement was not high enough to hold it, and the mud of the sin began to squeeze itself through all the cracks, and to ooze into the rooms of the house, and to fill every corner of the house with its damp, crawly smell. At last New Year's Day came. Reb Shmerl took hold of the sin in both his arms, and by pulling with all his might, managed to squeeze it through the door of the house. He got it out of the house, then he pushed, and rolled it down to the lake. There, he said as it sank into the water. I'm rid of that. The lake was angrier than ever. It hissed and shook itself and heaved itself upward, trying to hurl the sin back to the shore. Yet all of its rebellion was of no use, for it had been ordained when the waters were created that on New Year's they had to receive into themselves all of the sins of men and cleanse them. So at last the lake became quiet and set to work to cleanse the sin, but the deed of Reb Shmerl was not forgotten. The waters waited for vengeance. Reb Shmerl saw that his hair was becoming gray, and his wife had passed her best years, and still they had no children. At last he said, I will go to my cousin, Rabbi Israel. They say he performs wonders for every stranger that comes to his door. As for me, I'm a member of this family. He came to the Baal Shem Tov in Medzibuz, and he said, Cousin, I am growing old, and I would like to have a son to live after me. Rabbi Israel talked with him for a while, and remembered Shmerl's wife, the holy tzaddiket. At last the master said, Go home. I can only promise that you will have a son. But what more did I ask? said Reb Shmerl, and he began to dance with delight, but the Baal Shem Tov shook his head. The Baal Shem Tov's promise was fulfilled. Before the year was over, Shmerl's wife gave birth to a strong and beautiful boy. The father was so proud that he said, I will go at once on another journey to Rabbi Israel and thank him for what he has done for us. Then he came again to Medzibus and entered the cottage where the master sat studying. The master looked up at him, and the master's eyes were filled with deep, compassionate sorrow. When Reb Shmerl looked into the eyes of Rabbi Israel, all his joyous words faded from his lips. He did not know why, but he wanted to weep. Suddenly he was crying like a child. Then the Baal Shem Tov said to him, Your son will grow into a strong and happy boy. But on his thirteenth birthday, he will go into the water and drown. Reb Shmerl cried. He fell on his knees to Rabbi Israel and begged, Help me! Everyone knows that the Baal Shem Tov was not fond of weeping, but he remembered that the man's wife was a sadiket. Now he lifted up his cousin and said, The lake is angry with you because of that terrible black sin that you threw into it. There is only one way to save your son. On his thirteenth birthday, he must be kept away from the water. Reb Shmerl thanked him with all his heart. Reb Shmerl was filled with joy. His tears were forgotten. That is not difficult at all, he said. 
On his thirteenth birthday, I will keep him away from the water. And he was ready to run off on his way back home. But Rabbi Israel called to him and said, Do not think it is so easy to remember. You will surely forget the danger that awaits your only son. Reb Shmerl said, How could I forget? But the Baal Shem Tov, who saw even then how it would be with Reb Shmerl, said, Before you go, I will give you a sign that will help you to remember the day. When you awaken on that day, you'll begin to dress yourself, and you'll draw two stockings onto the left foot, and then hunt everywhere for the stocking for your right foot. Warn your household that on the day you cannot find your stocking, something terrible will happen. Reb Shmerl thanked him and returned to Constantin. And he thought, what a foolish thing the rabbi said about the stockings. So he didn't tell anyone about it. The boy grew. He was stronger than any of the other boys in old Constantin. He could run faster, and his eyes could see further, and his hands could move more quickly. As for learning, he had only to look upon a page, and he remembered it. But most of all things, he loved to swim in the water. He would dive to the very bottom of the lake, and there he would swim around seeking beautiful stones. These he would bring home to his mother. He learned to stay under the water for many minutes. The fishes would come in and out of his hands, playing with him. As Reb Shmerl saw his son growing up so strong and big, he forgot all about the gloomy warning of the Baal Shem Tov. By the time thirteen years had passed, he did not remember Rabbi Israel's prediction at all. And he prepared to celebrate the bar mitzvah of his only son with a great feast. On the morning of the boy's thirteenth birthday, Reb Shmerl was awakened by the heat of the sun on his face. It was hotter than it had ever been before, he thought. He felt his whole body burning as if it were inside a furnace. He began to dress himself. He felt very uncomfortable. He felt he had not slept enough. He was angry because the sun had awakened him, and his head hurt with the heat. He drew a stocking on his left foot, and then he stopped to wipe the sweat from his body. And then, without looking what he was doing, he drew his other stocking onto his left foot. Then he looked for the stocking for his right foot. He looked among his clothes and did not find it. He looked under the bed and did not find it. He got up and began to hop around the room, hunting for another stocking. He stumbled into the next room and blundered all over the house, knocking over chairs and hurting his knees and falling and balancing himself against the wall. And he muttered and cried with anger because the day was very hot and he could not find his other stocking. He shouted and woke his wife. "'What is the matter?' she said. "'Where is my other stocking?' cried Reb Shmerl. Then his wife arose to see what was troubling him. He pointed to his leg and muttered, "'Someone has hidden my other stocking. I can't find my other stocking.' The Tzadikit looked at her husband and saw that he was wearing two stockings on one foot, for when he went jumping around his stockings had become loosened. Look, Schmerl, she laughed, you have them both on your left foot. He looked and he saw. Then suddenly he remembered the words of Rabbi Israel, and he began to tremble, and he ran to the room where his son slept. The boy was not in his bed. Reb Schmerl ran to the door. He looked through the doorway and saw his boy already on his way to the lake. Reb Schmerl shouted to his son, Come back! But the boy answered, It's hot, I want to swim in the water. "'Come back!' cried the father. But the boy would not come back. Then, with one foot covered and the other foot bare, Reb Shmerl began to run after his son. The boy ran swiftly. The father saw him nearing the lake. "'Master, help me!' cried the father. Then the boy tripped over the root of an old tree. Before he could rise to his feet again, his father was at his side. "'Come home with me!' said the father. He led the boy to the house and placed him in a room and locked the door. It became very hot. The boy cried and beat on the door. Let me go to the lake, he screamed. I want to go to the lake. But they would not open the door. At last he begged them only to let him out of that room because it was so very hot in there. But they would not let him out of the room. After that he begged them to give him a pan of water with which to cool his body but Reb Shmerl was afraid to give him even a glass of water to drink. And after several hours, the boy became worn out and weak and fell to the floor and slept. Many people went to bathe themselves in the lake that morning, 
As the sun rose higher, the lake became filled with swimmers. They laughed and sported in the cool water. When the sun reached the middle of the sky and blazed angrily down on the earth, then nearly every soul in old Constantine was bathing in the lake. At exactly the hottest moment of noon, a disturbance began in the water. Ripples grew in circles around a certain spot near the shore, as though a stone had been thrown into the water there. The ripples widened and became a swirl, and out of the midst of the swirl a hand appeared, reaching up from the water. Then a second hand appeared. The two hands rose upward, reaching. The full arms appeared, hairy with greenish seaweed. And after the arms came long, floating seaweed hair. A head rose from the water, and a neck and shoulders, and the upper part of a body, all hairy with greenish seaweed. Then the head turned slowly from one side to another, and the arms reached outward, and the eyes looked into the faces of all the bathers. The mouth moved. The voice was harsh and deep. One is missing, it shouted angrily. And the head sank back into the sea. When the sun had gone down and night had come, the parents opened the room where the boy lay, worn out, sleeping. They woke him and gave him wine to drink and dainty things to eat, and they held the feast of his thirteenth birthday. It happened at Dunkirk, during the dark days of the war, when the English people were singing, There will always be an England, because at the time they weren't sure there would be. Every ship, boat, and anything that could float was mobilized to save the British trapped at the seaport town. In this Dunkirk there lived an elderly Mr. Nirenberg, and he had a beard. Now you see why the story has a beard. Mr. Nirenberg was a pious old Jew. Mr. Nirenberg was faithful to that commandment, a razor shall not go over thy head. It was a large, flowing beard, such as one of the prophets of Israel might have worn, or some great savant like Leonardo da Vinci, or perhaps Walt Whitman. His beard was his pride, and also his cross, as it were. Mr. Nirenberg knew that it had long been one of the Nazi sports to pull a Jew's beard. And now the Germans were near Dunkirk. That beard would certainly be fatal to him now. Dunkirk spelled doom to the British. To this man with a beard, there certainly would be no hope. He couldn't be identified more definitely as a Jew if he got a megaphone and proclaimed it to the Germans. Yes, it looked black for Mr. Nirenberg. He stood sadly at the docks and watched the English loading the boats, while the German shells were popping all around. He might go up and ask the English to take him with them, but they had not enough boats for their own soldiers. He was not an English Jew, he was a French Jew. The English would feel no particular obligation towards him. Yet, the English were the only hope of Mr. Nirenberg. He grasped at a straw. He went up to the captain of one of the English boats and asked to be taken with him. The captain looked at Mr. Nirenberg, looked and thought. Thought as much as it was possible to think in all the panic and confusion amid the downpour of German shells. Well, I'll tell you what, old man, I'll take you on one condition. What is that? asked Mr. Nirenberg. On the condition that on the way over you pray that we reach the coast of England safely. Mr. Nirenberg's face lit up. Agreed, he said and an idea came into his head. Captain, he said, there are half a dozen other Jews in Dunkirk. If you take them along, they will pray too. Won't God be more inclined to hear the prayers of many than of one? All right, bring them here, but do it quickly, said the captain. Mr. Nirenberg lost no time. All the Dunkirk Jews went over in that boat, and across the channel these pious Jews, in the ancient tradition of conduct during a great crisis, stood on the deck and chanted the psalms. The boat made the crossing in safety. When they were all safe, the captain turned to Mr. Nirenberg. You know why I took you? It was because of that beard. You look like a godly man with it, and I believe your prayers helped. And if the captain believed that they did, who shall say that they didn't?
One Friday night, Rabbi Israel, together with all his disciples, ushered in the Sabbath bride with joyous ecstasy. But immediately after he had recited the benediction, he leaned back in his chair and laughed uproariously. The disciples who sat around him looked on in stunned silence. They were too overawed by his sanctity to ask him why he laughed so. There was nothing they could see that could have given him cause for such laughter. A while later, he laughed again, and shortly thereafter, he laughed for the third time. The disciples were filled with amazement. Never before had they seen him do anything like it. Now it was the custom of Rabbi Israel that after the Hadala, the prayer service that ushered out the departing Sabbath bride, he would light his long-stemmed pipe. Then his disciple, Rabbi Kitzes, would enter his study and put to him all the questions about matters that had puzzled the disciples. This time Rabbi Kitzes asked him, Do tell me, Rabbi, why did you laugh three times yesterday? It must have been for some good reason. Have patience, I will soon reveal to you the reason why I laughed, replied Rabbi Israel. Another Sabbath custom of Rabbi Israel's was that every Sabbath night, after the Havdalah, he would ride out of Medzibaz into the country. This time he ordered his coachman to make ready the large carriage. He took along with him on this journey his closest disciples. All night long they rode in utter darkness, without knowing where they were going. When morning came, they suddenly found themselves in the town of Kozenitz. So they went to call on the head of the community. The whole town was full of excitement. Everybody talked of nothing but of Rabbi Israel's arrival. Many came to stand at a respectful distance and look upon his holy, radiant face. After Rabbi Israel had finished the morning service, he said to the head of the community, Send for Reb Shabsi, the bookbinder. Shabsi, the bookbinder, cried the elder, hardly believing what he had heard. What do you want to see that old man for? While we consider him a good man, he is not very learned in the law. It seems to me, Rabbi, that it won't be adding much dignity to a man of your greatness to talk to such a common person. After all, we do have scholars and Kabbalists in Kuznets. Surely you have more in common with them. But Rabbi Israel was firm. I have urgent need of Reb Shabsi, the bookbinder, he insisted. I must talk with him. So a special messenger was sent to fetch Reb Shabsi and his wife. When they finally arrived, Rabbi Israel said to him, Shabsi, I want you to tell all of us here what you did last night, but you must tell the truth, conceal nothing. I will tell you everything that happened, dear Rabbi, began Reb Shabsi, and if I have sinned in any way, I trust you will punish me with the right penance. Ever since I got married, I have earned my livelihood from binding books. I did well at one time. Every Thursday, I'd give my wife enough money to make the necessary Sabbath purchases of challah, fish, meat, wine, and wax candles. On Friday morning, I closed shop at 10 o'clock and went to the synagogue. There, I cantillated the Song of Songs and remained all day until after the evening services. That was my custom, all along until I grew old. Now I no longer have the energy to toil as I did before. I can hardly earn anything. When Thursday arrives, my wife can no longer afford to make the necessary Sabbath purchases. There is only one precept that I've been able to follow scrupulously in the days of my decline. At ten o'clock on Friday morning, I still close my shop and go to the house of study. Last Friday morning, I found I did not have even a groschen to give my wife, and I knew no one from whom I could borrow money, even for Hala. And I could not stoop to beg. Never in my life have I asked such help from people. Only in God did I place my trust, and when I saw that God had failed to provide for me the necessities for the Sabbath, I understood that it was just that it should be so. I then made up my mind to fast throughout the Sabbath. I had only one fear, that my wife would not be able to contain herself and would tell the neighbors. If she did, they would surely give her challah and other Sabbath foods. So I begged her not to accept any help from anyone, no matter what happened. Before I left the synagogue, I told my wife that I planned to come home that Friday night later than usual from the synagogue. I was afraid that I might accidentally meet some neighbor on the way who would be likely to ask me why there were no Sabbath candles burning in my house. So I remained behind in the synagogue until all had gone home. Then I left. While I was away in the synagogue, 
my old woman tidied up the house in honor of the Sabbath. But as she was putting things in order, she unexpectedly found an old jacket that she had mislaid for a long time. The jacket had silver buttons overlaid with gold, as was the fashion in olden times. So my wife went and sold the buttons, and, for the money, she bought large candles because I had told her that I would be late in coming. She also bought challah, fish, meat, and had some money left besides. I returned home from the synagogue quite late. What was my surprise to see large candles burning as I approached my house? I thought, alas, my old woman couldn't hold back from telling her troubles to the neighbors. When I entered the house, I found the table set. There was wine for the benediction and challah and all good things. I did not say anything to my wife because I did not wish to mar the Sabbath peace. My old woman saw, however, that I was not in a good mood. So after I had recited the benediction, she said to me, Do you remember, Shabsi, how long I've been looking for my old jacket with the silver buttons? Well, I found it after you had left for the synagogue. I sold the buttons, and what you see here was bought with the money I got for them. When I heard this, my joy was indescribable. I even shed tears and thanked the Heavenly Father that we could observe the Sabbath decently, without anybody's help. My joy was so great that I arose from the table, took my old woman by the hand, and we began to dance. After we had finished the soup, we danced once more, and after the sweet simus, the dessert, we danced for the third time. And so, holy rabbi, if you think that by doing this I have sinned, then I beg you to judge me, and what you say I'll do. God alone knows the truth that in dancing my intention was not to display levity, but to praise and thank him for the grace and loving kindness he has shown me. And when the old man had finished speaking, Rabbi Israel turned to his disciples and said, Believe me, when Reb Shabsi and his old woman laughed and danced with joy, all the angels in heaven could not restrain themselves, and they too laughed and danced through the celestial halls. And if the angels of heaven could not restrain themselves, how could I? So I laughed once, twice, and three times, just as they did.